So, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, was salat, was salam, ala Sayyid al Mursaleen, Muhammadin al Amin, Amma Bad. I have a very, very special guest with us today, Brother Jamil. We have been, uh, I don't know, we've known each other for a while now, Alhamdulillah. And uh, so, and, and he's a man of great insight. Um, every time I've talked to him, I've always learned something. So I think with that as an introduction, Brother Jamil, um, last time we were talking about a few days ago, uh, you brought up uh, a lot of interesting points that I wanted to go over with, um, with our students, with our listeners. Um, and uh, so we were talking about sound and the power of sound. And uh, we were talking about uh, COVID and how it was affecting the heart. Um, we were talking about honey <laughs> and the vibrations. So I'm just bringing that back to your memory. So you can start however you like, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As-salamu alaykum. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm ad-deen. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Iyadin sirat al-mustaqeema. Sirat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim. Ghayri al-maghdubi alayhim al-dhalin. Ameen. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إني أعوذ بك من أذاب الجهنم وأعوذ بك من أذاب الكبر وأعوذ بك من فتنة المحيا وممات وأعوذ بك من شر فتنة المسيح الدجال اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ومرزقنا اتباع وأرنا باطل باطل ومرزقنا اجتنابه اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الشقاق والنفاق وسوء الإخلاق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم جزاكم الله خير شيك to have me on again it's been a couple of years of Ramadan again is nearly upon us um, so yes uh, we have a number of topics to discuss my request is that the first one that we're going to discuss after we've completed that you end the call recording and then within a few minutes you call me back so that they are separate because this one the first one that we have to discuss is of paramount importance and um, it would be a shame for the other albeit they are important topics to cause distraction on this one so the the first subject that i want to discuss is I want to say the methodology for the study of the Quran, but that's not what the title of the video should be. It should be the methodology for the approach to the Quran. Basically, what is the purpose of the Quran for us human beings? And how do we get the function of the Quran from it? I cannot begin this talk nor end this talk without giving due credit to Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him, increase his life. Amen. And when it's time for him to go, may it be at a time when Allah is most pleased with him. Amen. So, I'm going to jump straight in. Um, I have difficulty talking to a camera. So now and again, I'll ask questions because it has to be, if it's not interactive, I get bored as well, you know. Um, the approach to the Quran requires two things before we get to the methodology. Number one is absolute honesty. And something that the Ummah is suffering from today is that we are not honest with ourselves. Whether it's because of our financial investments, our family ties, whatever it may be, we cover things up from ourselves. And that has to stop. People have to learn to spend time with themselves alone to the point where for a normal person that would be uncomfortable. When you pass the stage of discomfort, then your heart starts to speak to you. When the heart starts to speak, then you move, you move on. <clears throat> so I said there was two things that we had to do before the methodology for the study of the Quran. One is to be honest, and the other is to remove all 
ideas, conceptions, and even knowledge that we have in our head when we come to the Quran. Because every single thing is dangerous to you. You have to come to the Quran with like a fresh blank sheet as if you're five years old and you know nothing. If you want the teacher to teach you, and the teacher in this instance is Rabbul Alameen, then you have to come with nothing. If you have something, an idea, irrespective of whether you think it's correct or correct, is going to inhibit your ability to learn from the Quran. That is the meaning this of... This is very the, similar to what Dr. Sarayim wrote in his book, Obligations Muslims Owe to the Quran. And the first of the five was Iman. And in that, he said, you know, you have to kind of be objective, is the word he used instead of being truthful. And in that, you have to throw away all your preconceived notions. And this word that you used to approach the Quran as if fresh, uh, this is also what he talked about. Uh, a, like, kind of like at every moment, Quran is shining with a new, fresh light, so to say. And uh, that type of reading of Quran is just absolutely, it's like iman blowing, right? It just, uh, it's just, it's just reading Quran at a different level when, when that happens. I actually go out my way to have a very short conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before making any attempt to uh, understand the Quran. And one of the phrases that I use is, oh Allah, you know everything, I know nothing. And I say I know nothing to myself again and again and again until it's clear to me that I know nothing. Now I'm ready to learn. And the, the journey is nothing short of amazing. Nothing short of amazing. Lastly, I'd like to, and I, I think I mentioned this in the last lecture I did with you. People are going to be fools if they think that I am a scholar or that I'm doing something exceptional here. If you were to know me, I would be at the bottom of the pile in terms of those people who you know, should be recognized for anything in this dunya. But what I'm trying to say is if I can do it, there isn't a person on this planet who says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah that does not have a contribution to make. And they need to start making their contribution. So the methodology for the approach to the Quran is actually inside the Quran itself. This is not something that people have made up of the top of their heads. The evidence base itself is in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِئِ النُّجُومِ وَإِنَّهُ now, as a rule for myself, I like to read a few more passages so that I get the general gist of the conversation. I have to know what the subject matter of discussion is, so I have to recite a little bit more. وَإِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَّرُونَ So taking these ayah, if I ask somebody who has basic Arabic, what is the discussion here? The answer is the Qur'an, the kitab, which in itself is a reference to the Qur'an. That is what the discussion is. Now, Loosely translated, the first two ayah, which are the most important ones here, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِئِ النُّجُومِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he takes a qasm, an oath, by مَوَاقِئِ of نُجُومِ Nujum we know, is stars. The word مَوَاقِئِ in most English translations is translated as location i think there is better words uh, the example i gave recently to somebody when i was explaining it was 
imagine Yawm Eid is coming. Uh, you need some money. You go to your father. You say, Baba, Fadus, money. He says, why? I want to get some clothes for Eid. Instead of buying the clothes for Eid, you decide to get them made by the tailor. So you buy the cloth. You go to the tailor. You get measured up. All the measurements are done. Before you leave, you put your hand in your pocket. You take out a bundle of little plastic stars and you say, put one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. What are you doing? You're creating a pattern. You're creating a design. That is a better word that describes mawaqi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is taking an oath by the design that he has created of the stars. Now, after this oath, because many times in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes up an oath by that which he has created. Never before and never after has he followed taking an oath by this ayah. وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ And this, if only you knew, is a huge oath. What does that mean? That means that if I list all of the qasms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken in the Qur'an in order of priority, guess which one sits at the very, very top? This one. That then translates into you don't have permission to study any oath that's taken in the Quran until you study this one. That's the implication of the ayah that follows taking the oath. Allah has declared this is a huge oath if only you would know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken an oath by the design of the stars, yet the subject matter is the Qur'an. This is something that most people would just stop at and say, well, you know, leave it at that. No, this is where critical thinking starts. This is where you have to start looking into the details. So the first question I ask myself, what is the function of the stars? for the human being. And the stars have a function. So my question to you would be, as a human being, what has been the function of stars for human beings on this earth from the beginning of time? Two functions. Give me one. Guidance. Okay. So we go from one location to another by following the stars. What is the Arabic word for guidance? The word that Allah uses in the Quran again and again? Huda or Hadaya. Huda or Hidaya. Correct. What is the other function of the stars for the human beings? Light. Light. And what is the Arabic word for light in the Quran? Nur. Nur. The Quran makes a claim upon itself that it is nur and it is guidance. And now we have reached, there is something common between the Quran and something common with the stars. If the Quran is light for mankind, nur, and it is guidance for mankind, hidayah, then the implication of Allah mentioning the stars and the design of the stars is this. If you want nur from the Quran and you want hidayah from the Quran, you have to get it the same way you take it from the stars. So now we look at how do we get light from the stars and how do we get guidance from the stars? Now, if I go outside into the city and I look up into the sky, am I likely to see stars? No. 
Why not? Too much artificial light. <laughs> okay. And we refer to that light in the field of science as light pollution. So tell me if the following statement is true or false. Only when you are covered in darkness will the stars in the sky shine the brightest. I'm going to repeat that. Only when you are enveloped in darkness will the stars in the sky shine the brightest. Meaning, if I go to the middle of the desert or if I go to the middle of the ocean and I look up into the sky, I will see diamonds in the sky. That's how bright they will be. Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. What does that mean when it comes to understanding the Quran? Is it not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is implying that when the days of darkness come upon you, O mankind, when Yawm al fitan come upon you, O mankind, then turn to the stars, and the stars of the Quran are the ayah of the Quran. Turn to the stars, and you will see them in such brightness that they were never seen before. Mm -hmm. Which is that's happening. A, that's which a huge. Which statement. is happening for the people that have eyes to see. Uh, that that is a huge statement that I just made. Yes. People will argue. How can it be that those people around the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all the fourteen hundred and forty-four years that have passed, they couldn't see the stars shine as bright as you see them? Something wrong with your head? Well, I go back to the hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, my ummah is like the rain. It is not very clear to me which of the two showers are better, the first or the last. And secondly, upon the last sermon following the hajj, the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes them a witness. Have I delivered the message to you, yes or no? They become witnesses, affirmative, yes. Ya Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have indeed delivered the message to us. Then he makes a dua. What is his dua? He commands them to give the message to those that are not here. And then he makes a dua. Oh Allah, may those who are not here today understand it better than the ones who are here today. And I have to ask myself, would Allah accept that dua, yes or no? Of course. Of course. So, when also, the day... The Quran, on this very subject, from an eschatological perspective, the ayah stood, Fusilat, sanurihim ayatina, we will show them our signs, fil afaq wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana annahu al-haq. So this discovery of the Quran was... Re to reach, a, you can say, Hatta yatabayyana annahu al-haq. But on your example of the stars, I can't resist but share with you. Sayyid Nusi rahmatullah in his Risala, he mentions this same point you're mentioning by giving this example. He said that if you're carrying a torch at a night over a bridge, the torch will actually make you, uh, the flashlight will make you blind. And he said that when you're over the bridge, you won't be able to see much because of your flashlight until you turn off the flashlight and let the stars show you the way. So this is, uh, you can say Sheikh Sayyid Nusri Rahmatullah concurs with you. I'm going to expand on that with something that is even more relevant for the times that you and I are living in. So when I go outside in the city and I look up, I can't see the stars very well because of the pollution of the light around me. In this day and age, when I come to the Quran, what is the pollution I need to be wary of? Modern Western civilization, they call it the age of enlightenment. Look at the word as well, a word that contains the word light in it. 
if you do not get away from their so-called enlightenment of science, technology, whatever you want to call it, you're not going to see the stars of the Quran the way they are supposed to be seen. I'm going to now give you the example of driving. When you're driving a car and it's nighttime and it's a dark country road, you can see very clearly. What happens when a car comes in the opposite direction? Yeah. What's the words that you would use to describe what's happening to you? Getting blinded. Blinded, dazzled, dazed. Now tell me if what modern Western civilization has been bringing to the world for the past 300 years has not dazzled mankind, has it not dazed mankind, has it not blinded mankind, that's exactly what has happened. That's exactly what's happened. And when the car lights shine into your eyes, this is science now because I understand the science behind it, if you get a light and you shine it into your eyes, then you close your eyes, what do you see? You still see the light. You see the halo of the light. Because the rods and cones of the retina have had what's called super exposure. Even when you close your eyes for some time, that light is still dazzling the retina. And this is something to think about. That you can't just say, okay, I'm going to leave what modern Western civilization has given me and jump straight into the Quran. Some time has to pass by. You have to get accustomed to the light around you, like the example that you just gave from the Sheikh that you mentioned. Allow your eyes to get accustomed to your environment. And then you start to look. So if we want to understand if we want to understand the ayahs of the Qur'an in their maximum form, we have to make sure that our heart is not polluted with the so-called light of modern Western civilization. Now, how do you get guidance from the stars? If you follow one star, and every night that's the only star that you follow, you will go around in circles. Because that star that you're following, its position changes every night. The correct way to use the stars to navigate, and again, modern Western civilization has brought us Google Maps and blinded us, dazzled us with it to the point where we're not going to get true Hidayah. If you want guidance Hidayah from the stars, you have to look at the star of interest you then have to look at the ones that are nearby and are connected to it. And you have to study them as a group. When you study them as a group, you will see a shape, a design, a pattern. In the modern day, we call those constellations, Pisces, Capricorn, Cancer, etc., etc. It is the pattern that you have to follow. And despite the star that you're interested in, it's going to change its location within that pattern every night. If you follow the pattern, you will arrive at your destination. How do we transpose that to getting Hidayah from the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is implying through this example that if you take one ayah of my Qur'an and you base a fatwa on it, you're not going to arrive at guidance. Hmm. The only way for you to arrive at guidance from the Qur'an is to look at the ayah that you are interested in 
and then search the entire Quran that have the same subject matter, bring them all together and study them as a group. When you study them as a group, you'll see a sign, you'll see a pattern, and it's the pattern that you follow to get guidance. Now, I'm sure you have this recollection as I have. You're about 13, 14 years old, and you're in school, and you're doing algebra. And the teacher puts up the equation on the blackboard, A plus B minus C equals D, X squared, whatever it may be. And they teach you the individual components, and then you do a few examples. And that night you go home and you've got a worksheet and it's like one example after another, after another, after another, and you dread doing it. Halfway through, you're like, wow, this, this is easy. I enjoy this. Guess what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does when he's teaching? He does the exact same. And I'm going to show you the examples. So in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he declares, بَعْدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانُ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ تَسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ أَبَا وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ We commanded the angels make sujood to Adam and they all did it except Iblis. If you have no knowledge of anything in this world and you're four or five years old, and somebody comes to you and gives you this ayah and says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared that he commanded the angels to make sujood to Adam, and they all did it, except Iblis. Then according to this ayah, who is Iblis? And time after time after time, again, when I discuss this with people, they say to me, something other than what I expect them to say, because they're coming with preconceived ideas in their head. So I have to change the analogy. I tell them, I told all of my children to sit down and they all sat down except for Ahmed. Then who is Ahmed? Well, he must be one of my children. Yes or no? So based on that, who is Iblis? If Allah said, and I'll repeat it one more time because it requires repetition. If Allah said, we commanded the angels to make sujood to Adam and they all did it except Iblis. Then according to this ayah, who is Iblis? Remember, this is not a test of knowledge. This is learning. It's learning. And if you're not truthful, you won't learn. According to this ayah, Iblis is one of the angels because he said all the angels, then he said illa, meaning an exception, one is taken out, Iblis. But that's me following one ayah. And if I follow one ayah and come to a conclusion, what is Allah saying? You're going to get misguidance. So I have to comb the rest of the Quran. And I come to Surah Al-Kahf. Is it coincidence that it's Surah Al-Kahf? Man, what a great point. What a great Is it a coincidence that yeah. in Surah Al-Kahf, بَعَدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَ تِسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the same ayah from the beginning. We commanded the angels to make sujood to Adam. They all did it except Iblis and he was of the jinn. Wow, what it may, and it is true. It's like the Musa and Khidr story just being repeated or reflected in this example. Um, and this is part of being blinded, right? Part of being one eye is that uh, you don't have a holistic view. And that's one of the problems in the modern world. But I, I digress from what you're saying. What you're saying 
is extremely important. That the Quran, the guidance from the Quran is very similar to how we get guidance from the stars. <coughs> there are certain conditions for getting guidance in the stars. And one of them is you have to be in the dark. You have to, you're not going to get the, the proper light. And when you understand that, then you understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creating an age called Akhir zaman Too often for too long, and yes, it's important, the ulama and the fuqaha have warned of the dangers of Akhir zaman Yes, you must never take your eye off the dangers. But the wisdom behind it is that until that time comes, the light of the Qur'an and the hidayah of the Qur'an, the way Allah wants it to come to you, is not going to come to you. You have to be in darkness first. So Allah brings the darkness, and then from the darkness, he then brings out people who will follow the methodology and show people the light and show people the way. If we accept that we are in Akhir zaman then it becomes compulsory on every single Muslim who accepts that they're now in Akhir zaman to start doing this by following this methodology. Now, I have actually started this in reverse order and I've done it for a reason. Because before you make an attempt to study the Quran, something else has to take place. If you go and apply for a PhD program in any university in the world, the first thing they're going to ask you is, well, do you have a bachelor's? If you don't, you do not fulfill the criteria of studying for a doctorate. The study of the Quran is a higher level. Something comes before that. And that is that the heart cannot absorb the Quran unless it has a certain condition. The ayahs that we recited earlier from Surah Al Waqiyah, the passage that I recited, five ayahs in total, the last of them was La Yamasuhu illal mutwaharun. There are some Mufassirin who point to this ayah as the ayah that compels you and me to make tahira of the body, to make wudu before touching the Qur'an. I hope nobody misquotes me here. I am not advocating touching the Qur'an without wudu. But this ayah is not indicating that. And you just have to have basic knowledge of Arabic grammar to know that. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this passage was wanting you to understand that you have to have external purity, then the word would not have been mutahharun, it would have been mutatahharun. That's Arabic. La yamassu illa mutatahharun would mean of the external. This ayah means no one can touch it. Meaning no one can touch this Quran and get light from it or guidance from it until there is Qahira of the qalb, purity of the heart. That is what Allah is saying. When we have already established that بَعْدَ عَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِئِ النُّجُومِ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسُمُ اللَّهُ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمِ is all about understanding the Qur'an, getting light from it and getting nur from it. Then this ayah لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَّرُونَ means nobody can touch it. It's actually a challenge more than anything else. No one can touch it unless you're pure. 
If it was external purity, then 1400 years ago, if I want to prove the Quran false, I just come in a state of najasa and touch the Quran and say, there you go, I did it. Now what? But that's not what the ayah means. And we know, for example, when we do wudu, we have some du'as that we recite, you know, ashadu la ilaha Allah, ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Allahumma ja'alni, subhanakallahum wa bihamdika la ilaha la antas. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa min al-mutatahhirun. Wa ja'alni min al-mutatahhirun. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatahhirun. Yes, mutatahhirun. This is external. Tawahira of the outside. In this occasion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about tawahira, purity of the heart because it's the heart that's going to receive the light and it's the heart that's going to receive the guidance not the hands and feet so how do you purify the heart it's not rocket science Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said renew your iman regularly we acknowledge that iman goes up and down, up and down. They asked, Ya Rasulullah, how do we do that? And the reply came, La ilaha illallah, kathiran. So the iman is now renewed. How do we purify the heart? Numerous ahadith, and you'll be able to tell me what they are and the references, where the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving instruction for the recitation of the Qur'an for it removes impurities and those black stains from the heart the way an iron monger will remove rust from metal. It purifies the heart. The recitation of the Qur'an. The book is called Quran, the recitation. If you don't recite it, forget doing anything else with it. Is it a coincidence that the very first word Jibreel al Islam speaks to the Nabi of Allah in his physical presence is what? Iqra. He replies and says, I am illiterate. I am illiterate. Then he is embraced. Then he understands I'm being told to recite. That same word is the title of the Quran. To recite. So do we just make up from the top of our heads? what to recite, how much to recite, and when to recite? No. When the following has taken place, you can't do that. A man comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah, how much Quran should I recite? Hmm. The reply is given, one month. That's a very unusual answer for that question. He then says, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am young, I am healthy, I can do better than this. The reply comes, 10 days. He then says, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am young, I am healthy, I can do better than that. The reply comes, seven days, and the conversation is over. It does not take degrees in rocket science to understand that the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was putting the goalposts, the limitations on this side and that side for the recitation of the Qur'an. The indications are that the Qur'an should not be recited and completed cover to cover in less than seven days. And on this side, the indication is that the Qur'an recitation from cover to cover should not take more than 29 
or 30 days, depending on the length of the month. When I say month, I have to remind our audience, a month is not January, February, March, April, May. The months, Allah SWT has decreed that the months are measured by the moon. So Muharram, Safar, Rabi al Awwal, these are the months. You can do it seven days, eight days, nine days, all the way up to 29 days. But what Sheikh Imran Hussein has done as a mercy for the Ummah is to break it down to the easiest, which is the full month. And then he has divided the entire Quran into surahs manageable to recite within about one hour a day to complete the entire Quran. Now, when you start to recite the Quran in this manner, you start to notice things. The first six surah are long surahs. I wish I could bring to you the scientific studies of what happens to the energy of man and the energy of the creation on the earth within the first six days of the lunar month. I wish I had that research to show you. That in these six days, if you keep a mental note of it and then watch your children, Every time the new month begins, look at their energy levels for the first six or seven days. Very high, and then slowly, slowly goes down. So the first day we have Surah Al-Baqarah. There are six very long surahs in the first days. When you're reciting the surah, and verses come up, words come up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many, 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 many times talks about creation, 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 creation. Is that a coincidence? How many days does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put into creating creation? How many days? Six. Six days. Is that a coincidence? Of course not. And then you come to the seventh day. You have Surah Anfal. <coughs> What is the surah that comes after Surah Al-Anfal? Al-Anfal means the Tawbah. Surah Al-Tawbah. What is unusual about Surah Al-Tawbah? There is no Bismillah. There is no Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the beginning of Surah Al-Tawbah. And it is the opinion, and I cannot argue with this opinion of Sheikh Imran Hussein. That the reason why Bismillah Rahman Rahim is absent from the beginning of Surah Tawbah is an indication from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Keep going. Don't stop at Surah Al Anfal. The past six days you did one surah, one surah, one surah. Now you have to continue. You're doing at least two. Otherwise, what are the other reasons the Fuqaha and the Mufassirin come to that there is no Bismillah Rahman Rahim? What? They say there is a Bismillah al rahim somewhere else. What does that mean? That Allah forgot to put it here, so he threw it in there? Na'udhu Billah. It's an indication not to stop at the end of Surah Al-Anfal, carry on. And when you start doing two surahs a day, and you get to the 14th night, is it a coincidence, I ask the audience, that on the 14th night you're reciting Surah Noor, what happens on the 14th night? You have the full moon. When you start to recite the Quran like this, the recitation, which is doing what? Purifying the heart is now in line with natural time. When you do that, month after month after month, amazing things happen. You look at something, Allah shows you the reality that's behind it. Mm -hmm. That is what happens. When other people see the outside and they recognize the names of it, you see the inside. You don't know the names, but you know the reality of it. Now you're ready to penetrate the Quran. Now you're ready 
Remember the ayah? La yamasuhu. Nobody can touch it. Nobody can penetrate it. Illa al-mutahharun. Except the one who has internal purity. So you have to continue with the recitation until you start to see things internally. When you recognize that, hold on, there's a change taking place in me, in my view of things, now you're ready to come to the Quran for the purpose of study. And the reason why I left this part to the end, because as you can see now that I did it in reverse order, it should be purifying the heart, which then follows on to knowledge. And there is an ayah in the Quran, uh, la ilaha illallah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, tazkiyah of the Quran, which is dhikr, and then knowledge, yuzakkihim, what you are them. Huh? Yes, they're in that order. The recitation, that's indicating the recitation first. And then knowledge from it. And that's what we have to do. If we as Muslims in this day and age, we recognize that we are in the end of times. And we do not do whatever we have to do to start reciting the Quran cover to cover, taking no longer than one lunar month and no shorter than seven days, we have nobody to blame. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches you by connecting the dots of the stars. I don't know about you, but many parents, I myself, when my oldest son was about two and a half, three years old, I was in the city center, it was evening time. I was walking along and there was a bookshop, unusual, a bookshop still opened. And I thought, oh, I wandered in. And I'm walking around and I'm walking around and I saw something and I picked up a book and I took it home. The next day after school, I said to my son, I've got something for you. And he's so excited. He opened the book. And on the first page, it's just numbers. He's looking at it. Like there's no text on it, nothing. I put a crayon in his hand. And I say, this is number one. And we draw a line to number two. We then draw a line to number three. We then draw a line. To, this is connecting the dots now. And when we finish, it's the shape of a parrot. And he gets the pleasure of coloring it in. Now, I'm going to give you some science here when you study medicine and biology you learn about development of the human being they say that the first sign of a functioning brain of the human being is hand eye coordination you know if you do that and the child does that as well that is the first milestone of a functioning brain. That is the level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching you at. For those people who say, oh, it's too difficult for me, there is no excuse in Yawm al -Qiyama. No excuse in Yawm al -Qiyama because the level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching at is even pre-kindergarten. Because hand-eye coordination comes a couple of years before the child goes to kindergarten. It's just the ability to connect the dots, to connect the dots, to connect the dots. That's the level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching at. But we are not honest with ourselves. We lie to ourselves. I'm going to give you the example of somebody I was in conversation with one day. I said to him, when you recite in salah, do you understand the meaning of Al-Fatiha? Yani you read it minimum 15 times if you add up all of your fara'id. The answer that I got was, we are illiterate. Our parents didn't send us to school. You know, 
from the land that we came from. I said, but don't you think you should try? I just told you we were illiterate. So then I said, and do you think that's going to be okay on the day of judgment? Like with that excuse, you've got an exemption? The answer was, of course, why not? I then said, I don't think that's going to work. And I was challenged, why not? How not? I said, we recognize on Yom al Qiyamah, our body parts are going to give witness. Your tongue is going to come out your mouth. And on your tongue is going to be another tongue. And that tongue is going to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabbul Alameen, this man left a backward village from Pakistan, from India, from Sudan, from Somalia, traveled halfway around the world, went to the West. Within a week, he was able to converse in a foreign language for the purposes of earning money. Within a week, he knew the minimum. He knew how to order his food. He knew how to take money from a person and give them change. But in the following 30 years, he couldn't come to your Quran with anything except the excuse of, we are illiterate. Your own life is going to be an, a, a, a witness against you. There will be no excuse on Yom al Qiyamah. We have to be honest with ourselves. And for those of us who are honest and yet still have some laziness, whatever it may be, then raise your hands in dua. Because when you're honest and you ask from Allah, Allah responds. If you're going to cover it, oh, we were this, we were illiterate, it's not going to work. You have to say, oh Allah, I want to do that. I'm lacking the time, I'm lacking energy, I don't know where to start. Help me. I swear Allah will help. So I urge all the viewers, if you are able to recite the Quran, then make use of that skill and recite the Quran cover to cover once a month. We are now in the month of Rajab. Today for me, the it's evening time, so the seventh of our job has begun. I don't know what date it is for you. Yeah. But Rajab is referred to as the month of planting. And Sha'ban is referred to as the month of watering. And Ramadan is referred to as the month of harvest reaping. Mm -hmm. So if there is a month to begin the recitation of Quran, if you have not done it to date, you've only missed six or seven days. You still have another 21 days. Plant and plant well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Because if you recognize you are on end of times and you neglect this, you will have no choice but to follow somebody. And these days are the days of great liars. They are the days of Dajjal. And if you want to risk just following somebody, then that's up to you. On that, I want to add, since you mentioned Akhiru Zaman, it's the Waqia. The surah begins by telling us about Akhiru Zaman when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As sabiqun, as sabiqun. And then mentions the, you know, thullatu min al-awwaleen wa qalilu min al -akhirin. And so there will be a few, but significant uh, number of people in Akhiru Zaman who will be as sabiqun And the ending then gives us a hint with this qasam that who they will be. Who will be they? They will be those people who... Allah allowed them and blessed them to touch the Quran at whatever capacity that Allah willed. Allah May Allah make us of those people that are able to attain the guidance of Quran, the nur of Quran, and to be able to purify ourselves enough to touch the Quran.
I mean, I mean, and this is, you know, getting to the point of studying the Quran, that's not the end point. That's, you know, all you've done is, you know, the five-year-old kid on Yawm al Eid, he gets a big box, you know, and he's taking the wrapper off. That's what stays that you've reached. Taken, when you start to study the Quran, you've just taken the wrapper off. You know, you've yet to get into the box. You've yet to get into the, 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 the diamonds and the gifts. And if people remember my last talk, if you're able to link it to this video, please do. When I mentioned the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, I want to touch on that now. I'm not going to mention the hadith. People have to do their own research. One of the reasons, one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Jibreel alayhi salam for this event. When you think that he is coming to the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam day in and day out, 23 years, physically, in dreams, He's his best friend from the Malaika. He's an advisor. He's a protector. So many things. And nobody sees him. Why today he is seen? And why today in human form? There is a subject that if you do not study it alongside with contemplating study of the Quran, you will make many, many mistakes. And that is history. For Jibreel alayhi salam is an eyewitness to the entire of history. That's the reason why he was chosen. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands me and you in the Quran, travel the world and look at what happened to the nations that came before you. If that is not a command to study history, then what is? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. That's a command to study history. Because when you have historical facts correct in front of you, then the Quran will connect the dots for you. But you have to have the historical facts. And that's the reason why people are not able to conclude things like, who are Ya'juj or Ma'juj? What is modern Western civilization's role in, in the history of mankind? Is it significant? Is it not significant? Only if you know proper historical facts, like when was it those people who were expelled from that land for 2,000 years, when did they go back? Who helped them? The British. What was the Balfour Declaration? You have to have all these facts in front of you and you've got in front of them. The Quran will come and knock you on your head and say, these are the people you have to be wary of. It is their light pollution that's going to stop you from getting light from the Quran. And what do they do with knowledge? The Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indicating in the Quran that everything is connected. Yes or no? Hmm? What do these people do? They do the opposite. Yeah, they, they fragment everything. Knowledge. Yeah, they so create you, PhDs. So when you have palpitations and you go to the cardiologist, the cardiologist is not allowed to sit with any other field specialist and discuss you as a patient. Not allowed because they have compartmentalized knowledge. It's just a heart. Does it matter that it's connected to blood vessels and the entire rest of the body? Does it matter that it sends oxygen to every other part? No, you don't care. And that is how they fill you. You have to connect the dots. It is only today that the most research is being done in cardiology that indicates that the cause of just about every cardi cardiac disease comes from the mouth. So you now have some physicians, a handful on the planet, that when you go to them because you have a problem with your heart, they want to send you to a biological dentist. 
a, an actual proper dentist, not somebody who's going to start taking your teeth out, but a person who understands the connection between the oral cavity and the heart. They will write a report and send it to the cardiologist, and the cardiologist is going to say, okay, we've got to fix out the problems in your teeth, if we, in your mouth. If we fix those, the heart will get better. That's only possible by connecting the dots. There are many, 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 many people over the past two years, before that, they would happily go and get any jag for any you know, disease. And they've now realized, hold on, hold on a second. I need to increase my immunity. How do I do that? I need to start eating properly. I need to increase the good microbiome in my gut. It's all in the stomach. And then the Quran will push you to the hadith. The Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the majority of mankind's diseases originate from a vessel he inappropriate fills. Which vessel is that? It's the stomach. We're now connecting dots. To understand the Quran, you have to have the habit of connecting dots. If you were born and raised in the Western world, if you look up to the Western world, you will not have that habit. That's true. You've got to break away from it. Very significant statement. I wish you could repeat it. I'll repeat it for you. If you're born in the modern, Western, enlightened world, you're taught to fragment things, comp uh, compartmentalize things, and you're not taught to connect the dots. And the Quran is an ayah, which is an ayah by its nature wants to be connected. It's a sign. That's what a sign does. You know, in, in philosophy, there's a subject called semiotics, which is the study of signs, which is a sign points to something else. It's connecting to something else. And so, they, they don't, they, they, the way they teach everything, it's so fragmented that you never get the bigger picture. 100%. And on many instances, for some reason, I don't know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. From a very young age, I was always looking at connections. Always looking at connections. And many instances in my adult life, I, I surprised myself by saying things. Uh, one example, um, I think it was the year 2006 or 2007. For some reason in that year, there was um, a lot of hype about the MMR, mumps, measles, rubella, combined vaccination. Uh, uptake for that vaccination was, had been declining in those years rapidly. So the media was talking about how safe it is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I sat with a colleague of mine over a coffee who was an ophthalmologist and he had a friend that was over with him who was a neurologist and I said to the neurologist how safe is this MMR? He says very safe. I said take your NHS cap off and then talk to me and tell me how safe it is and he says no he goes I believe it's, it's safe as a triple vaccine it's safe. So then I said to him, okay, I learned when I studied my first degree in human development that the part of the brain that is responsible for communication and social interaction in males versus females, the peak of that development takes place at different ages. For example, now I can't recall the exact, it's been a long, long time since I studied. Let's say that for the males, it's 18 months to two years is when the peak development takes place. And in the females, it's six months earlier. And you're giving this vaccination to both males and females. The government policy is that they have it done at 24 months. 24 months is that point in the development of males where most of the development is taking place. The disease itself that people are complaining about, autism, it's a very wide disease. But if I were to sum the disease up, 
It's a disease of communication and social interaction. That's where it affects you. And it somehow affects males more than females. That's established. The neurologist looked at me and said, do you know, that's probably exactly what's going on. And I looked at him, I said, excuse me. I nearly choked on my tea that I was drinking, excuse me. And he said to me, that's probably what's going on. I said, don't you think you should go and do some research, clarify it, stop it, because these children are going to suffer for the rest of their lives. Mm. Now, it wasn't long, it wasn't long before the government in the UK changed the age at which they administered the vaccine. Mm. Maybe they recognised it, maybe they didn't. But the neurologist couldn't see what I could see. Okay, if the vaccine really is safe, could it be that it's getting administered at a critical time in development that holds back development long term? Allahu alam. But I was sitting there with an established neurologist who said, you know, that's probably exactly what's going on. If I was a neurologist, I would have dropped my coffee and ran to the laboratory and said, okay, we've got to do some, we've got to do some tests and trials because this is going to save people's lives is going to help people function like normal human beings. So connecting the dots is what the Quran is all about. Why, 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 why is always a question you have to start with and end with. Because when you start to understand the connecting of the dots, then you understand, you begin to understand the relationship between me and my creator. There's actually a relationship there. If you follow the methodology for the correct approach to the Quran, I'm going to say something that a lot of people might laugh at, but it's very important. If you follow the correct methodology, meaning you recite the Quran cover to cover, you come to the Quran with the purpose of getting light and know. You take light and rule from the Quran the way you take it from the stars. Not only will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up ayah for you in the Quran, but there will be things that will happen in your life that will be clear signs from Allah. It's like Allah's talking to you. You'll see those connections in your own life. We as Muslims need to understand this is not a book that sits on the bookshelf. It's not a book of mythology or mysticism. It is something living. It is alive and it requires your tongue to bring it to life. Otherwise, the burden we will have on Yawm Al-Qiyamah will be massive. I have the feeling you have to pray. That's correct. So when you're finished, message me and we can, because we finish this topic now, and then we can move on if you have time. Inshallah, exactly.